giving me this opportunity. Let me hide this. Perfect. So today I'm going to talk about a pulse sequence called parahydrin and discriminated FIP, which can be combined with pre-existing sequences in order to deliver cleaner results. I will show you two examples where this sequence can be added as an acquisition block in order to improve resolution and sensitivity of the experiments. <clears throat> Just a few minutes. <laughs> It's just freeze. There you go. Sorry for the, for the delay. In a typical AX system, the, um, the resulting spectrum presents these two antiphase doublets. With this, this splitting, uh, it's, it's ranging between 3 and 20 hertz in, for protons in liquid samples. So having these really well resolved lines, in some cases, may be difficult to obtain. Any perturbation that it creates an enhance in the line width, will produce partial signal cancellation, as you can see here. In case of a thermal spectrum, an enhance in the line width will only, will only be traduced in a loss of resolution, but the integral will remain constant, as you can see here. But, on the other hand, due to this anti-phase um, behavior of the, of the FIP signal, an increase in the line width will be um, traduced in a loss of the, uh, of the signal. So, one way of dealing with this is with jet spectroscopy. Jet spectroscopy is a technique released in the early 70s where only the, um, where you apply a train of refocusing pulses and only the top of the echo are acquired. In a weekly couple system, among carefully setting the post repetition rate, evolution with linear, uh, with uh, Hamiltonian, with linear spin operators like the chemical shift or the BCO in homogeneities, we will refocus at this time. But evolution with this type of Hamiltonians with bilinear operator, like the J. Kabnik Hamiltonian, will not be refocused. So if you collect these points at the top of the echo and you Fourier transform them, you will obtain a J spectrum with information of the J coupling of the system. In order to have a pure J spectra, this condition must be fulfilled. You have to have a strong magnetic field in order to ensure the weak coupling system. The post repetition rate must be smaller than the smallest difference of chemical shift. The pipe pulses must be set carefully and the J coupling must be the only source of modulation. Any violation of these four conditions will lead to different consequences. I will no longer be talking about a J spectrum, instead we have a spin echo spectrum. So let me please briefly review how J spectroscopy works. In case you have this NMR system with these multiplets, the line width depends on the B0 in homogeneities. But as you perform the, uh, the sequence shown before, all these multiplets will collapse to zero because the chemical shift disappear. But also these lines will be better resolved because the inhomogeneity will also be disappear. If you have this, if you have this NMR system with all these multiplets, everything will collapse to zero, and this, these peaks will interfere with each other, and you got no information at all. So there is an elegant solution to this, and is perform the sequence as before, but do the acquisition, applying a digital filter on the desired frequency that you want to see. That will result in this multiplet, the multiplet inside the acquisition filter collapse it at zero frequency. This is called partial J spectroscopy. This technique was applied by our group in a one hexane FIP system where the former parhydrogen molecule reacts at the sites of the one hexane molecule. 
here show you some simulation of the of the spectrum where the hybridization is confined and these are simulation of the partial j spectrum for each product and these are the experiments that we obtain you can see here the size and the position of each digital filter each 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 of these um, j partial j spectrum corresponds to a different experiment if you perform one one partial j spectrum applying the digital filter at this frequency and another one applying the digital frequency here, the, the digital filter in this frequency. You can see that we obtain resolution of 0.6 Hertz and all this information is right here, based behind the curtains of the B0 in homogeneities. What I will show you now is which is the best phase arrangement from the viewpoint of the, of the J spectroscopy. One would simply put a CPNG with all the pulses with the same phase, but experiments and simulation showed us that this phase arrangement does not compensate the offset effects produced by multiplets nearby the spins inside the data acquisition wheel. So that's why we use this simulation with ideal rotation in order to know how the perfect partial J spectra would look like. So if the, the CPNG is not an option, we perform experiments and simulation on these other three super cycles where we adopt this terminology, where the number right here represents the size of the super cycle. Experiments and simulations, uh, what showed us is that the CPMG4 or MLEP4 with this phase arrangement is the, is the, is the phase arrangement that gives us the most accurate um, spectrum compared with the, uh, with the one with ideal, uh, with ideal rotations. So this is the phase arrangement that we'll use for all our, of our experiments. This advantage of um, enhancing the resolution in FIP experiments is not the only advantage that we find apl applying this train of, re of refocusing pulses. Our group um, realized that FIP and, FIP and thermally signals behave differently during this train of refocusing pulses. This combined with the property of the fast Fourier transform algorithm give us a tool to discriminate any thermal polarized spins from the signal from thermal polarized spins than one coming from FIP, or from FIP spins. We call this the parahydrogen discriminated FIP or PhD FIP. In order to understand this, I will show you the evolution of the, um, of the thermal and FIP operators in this subspace defined by the uh, J. Capney Hamiltonian. I'll show the evolution of one spin operator as the other one is, is uh, the other spin is exactly the same. So when you apply the first excitation pulse, in case of a thermal operator, it will give us observable polarization. In the case of the FIP, as you know, it will give us non-observable polarization. So after that, both operator evolved during half echo time with the J. Kaplan Hamiltonian before the first pi pulse is applied. When this first refocusing pulse is applied, the big difference between each, between each operator appears. You can see that this operator commutes with the operator of the, of the pi pulse. And this one right here changed its sign twice. So the thermal operator is transparent to all the uh, to all these pi pulses. But in case of the FIP operator, it will suffer a phase shift in its evolution plane because each operator of these ones change its sign. So when both operators reach its first echo, this, is, this will be the signal described by, by the thermal operator and this one by the FIP. You can pay attention to this minus right here, which comes from this phase shift Due to this phase, due to, due to this first pi pulse. If we continue this line of reasoning, when both operators reach the second echo, the, the thermal signal will remain having this uh, usual cosine uh, phase, but, but the phase of the fifth signal would be the opposite compared with the one with the first echo. So we continue doing this during the time. This will be this, the signal described by the thermal operator. This one right here, the one by the fit. And if you Fourier transform them, this is the spectrum that we will, the, the J spectrum that, we, that you will obtain. And let me be clear here. 
Usually in NMR, you perform a shift in the frequency axis in order to have these peaks, these thermal peaks in the middle. But if you don't do this, this shift, this is what you will obtain. You will see that even though you, you, do not, you don't do this shift, the FIP signal, the FIP peaks appear in the, in the middle, in the center of the spectrum. That's why this factor, that's because this factor, uh, due to this phase shift of the, of the operator, is the same as doing the shift in the fast Fourier transform algorithm. So here we have a tool to discriminate um, this contribution, the contribution coming from thermal polarized spins than from FIP polarized spins. And this is not restricted to, uh, to an, an AX system. In fact, we performed experiments again in the one hexen, in the one hex, in a high polarized one hexen. And also we, we did experiments in a sample, which was a mixture of the one hexen plus the dichloromethane, which has a, which has a peak right here in the region of interest. Here is the size and the position of the digital filter that we apply. And when, and when we executed the, um, the PhD FIP sequence, this is the J, the J spectra that we obtained. In order to know that these big peaks right here are the dichloromethane, let me zoom the region in the center, and you will see that the spectra are exactly the same. So here, we again, we obtained this tool to discriminate but not eliminate any thermal contribution to our experiments. In order to remove any thermal contribution, the OPSI sequence was released years ago. It exploited this double quantum feature of the Pasadena initial operator, and this, will, and this could result in an enhance in the sensitivity because better, ratio, better signal to noise ratio can be achieved, enhancing the, the receiver gain and avoiding any saturation because we eliminate any thermal contribution. And as I already told you, the PhD FIP sequence uh, could be a, a really good tool to enhance the resolution of the experiment. So it seems quite natural to combine both sequences in order to get the best of both worlds. This type of combination of these both of these sequences could be really helpful when we have this type of sample where we have this big contribution of thermal, of thermal spins. This type of sample were made on purposes to demonstrate well, the, the, how, this, uh, how this combination of sequence acts. When you apply the OPSI sequence by itself, the characteristic doublets appear and an enhance in the, res in the sensitivity is obtained bec because we can rise the receiver gain. This rise in the receiver gain could be done by the PhD fit by itself because even though we apply the digital filter at this frequency, the, um, the receiver acquired all the frequencies before the filtering process is performed. So we first need to eliminate this thermal contribution that's why we apply the filter, the OPSI sequence first, and then we acquire with the PhD FIP in order to enhance the resolution. So we run this sequence, and this is the spectrum that we obtain. You can see that we, here we obtain a resolution of 0.4 hertz, and all this information comes from this tiny peak right here. Well, the second and final example that I will show you is that we measure the diffusion of a small amount of molecules um, re re reacted uh, in, the, in the reaction mixture. We wanted to measure the diffusion of only the reacted molecules with par, with par hydrogen acquired with the PhD FIP sequence. When you inject the par hydrogen in the sample, you may create some turbulence or even bubbles that not, that not only broaden your yeah, spectral resolution, but also perturb the motion of the molecules that we want to measure. So that's why we create this, um, that, that's why we made this reaction chamber where the core fits are these hollow Teflon tubes, which are connected to these plastic Festo tubes, which is connected to the PH2 uh, reservoir. When the reaction chamber is filled, with the reaction mixture, the par hydrogen flow through the Teflon tubes with enough pressure that it permeates through the wall 
of the of these Teflon tubes and it dilutes and it dilutes through the sump. In that way, we um, avoid the presence of, of bubbles. And we realized that by measuring the diffusion coefficient before and after the bulb was open. So first, we used this sample that was a, a mixture of one hexane plus diluted in the, in, the, in the acetone in the same proportions that the reaction mixture would have. No catalyst is present, is present in this sample, so we can avoid any, so we avoid any, any hydrogenation. And as I already told you, we measured the diffusion coefficient before and after the bulb is open. You can see here a rise in the diffusion during the first hour, hour and a half, and then it stabilizes. This behavior of the diffusion coefficient could be done by bubbles because this number, this, co this coefficient should, should change in orders of magnitude if bubbles were present. We, re we realized that this behavior is produced by the, by the gas because it creates a gradient of pressure which induces a convection in the, in the liquid. This type of, uh, of motion is a much further motion than, than other type of perturbation due to the molecules. And in fact, it can be easily removed applying this double encoded say, gradient sequence. When we execute this sequence, you can see that we achieve constant diffusion, diffusion coefficient during almost um, three hours. So this is the this is the sequence that we'll use to measure our to measure the, the diffusion of the reacted molecules. So we have the sequence, we change our sample to the reaction mixture. This is one uh, this mixture one hexene plus the diacetone the, um, the rhodium catalyst. And in order to um, execute our diffusion experiments, we need an amount of time, around six or seven minutes, of constant polarization. So we monitor the, the reaction, acquiring with the PhD FIP every two minutes. And you can see the um, a rise in the polarization during the, during the first 10 minutes, where the catalyst is activated. Then we have this span, this window of 42 minute time where the polarization is almost constant, and then the hyperlization decrease. Remember that when, you, when we acquire with the PhD FIP, we can discriminate the FIP, the FIP signal from the thermal one, and we integrate this so we can obtain each of these points. Everything here is coming from FIP uh, polarized spins. So, again, we use this um, sample with low degree of hyperpolarization. When the parahydrogen is flowing through the, through the Teflon tubes, the sample is a mixture of the non-reactive one hexene plus the thermal one hexene represented in red, the hyperpolarized one hexene represented in green, and the deuterate acetone, which we diluted our catalyst in representing in red. You can see here the spectrum where we achieve this uh, low degree of hyperpolarization in order to mimic this highly diluted uh, sample. Any, any thermal contribution here represented in red is a mixture of these two. So we apply this, this sequence when we, when, when we did encoding with the double post grain spin echo, and we acquire with the PhD fit, with the PhD fit. That give us this J spectrum that we integrate so we cannot so we in, obtain this each point of these intensities and we obtain a more exponential decay when we can well where we can calculate the diffusion coefficient of only the molecules that reacted we believe that we could that this could, this could be a tool to monitor the motion um, of different FIP experiments and to finish let me tell you that the PhD FIP sequence does not decrease its performance at low field. We, execute, uh, we executed experiments at the 0.4 Tesla mini, mini spec. And as you can see here, before the hydrogenation, we have only thermal polarized spins and everything goes to the borders. Well, and after the hydrogenation, this big peak and this peak antiphase peak appears. So again, of course, here we don't have J, J spectroscopy, this is clear spin echo spectrum, but we still have this property of discriminating uh, the signals between coming from its source. 
So this could be really helpful in case of um, measuring the efficiency of, NCAT of, of a catalyst or maybe, like in this case we did, monitor the reaction. You can see here that we, we bubble during these first 10 minutes where the hybridization rise to do, to do this maximum. Then we turn off the gas. The hybridization should go to zero because nothing will appear here. And then we turn on the gas again so the hybridization rise. And then when everything reacts, it goes straight down to zero. So, well, to finish, let me thank all the FIP group in Cordoba, Argentina, uh, Rodolfo, Maria Belen, Lisandro, well, me, and everyone that in a different way uh, participate to all these projects. And thank you for your attention, of course. Thank you for a great talk. Um, we have a couple questions queued up. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first questions was, would this sort of method work well for applications of FIP in um, non deuterated solvents where you have a heavy signal or a large signal from a uh, pronate, pronated solvent to start to suppress that. Sorry, right, a uh, heavy signal of what? Uh, from the pronated solvent, if you're using a pronated solvent instead of a deuterated solvent. Uh, I am not aware of what, it, what is uh, that type of solvent. So instead of acetone, um, deuterated acetone using just regular acetone. Yeah, well, the regular acetone will give us signal, but we can still re re remove it with the PhD FIP uh, sequence. So I think, yeah, it might work. Mm -hmm. I think that's what the question was about. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other question um, that we received was, have you looked at doing this work for SABER at all? And um, in terms of uh, emphasizing hyperpolar signals and SABER over the thermal signals? No, no, we always use this type of, of procedure. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't use, or we didn't even think about this Sabre. Do you think that this would work for Sabre? Um, yeah, I think it might, it, it might work. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for some sharing some exciting results. Thank you.